This is the last time you will hear from me. As a reminder, the prosecution bears the burden of proof beyond a reasonable doubt. It is clear in all of our minds that the prosecution failed to meet their burden of proof. It is also clear in all of our minds that Mrs. Powers is innocent. Ladies and gentlemen, please return the only verdict that fairness and justice requires, a verdict of not guilty for Mrs. Powers. Thank you. Thank you. All right, and on behalf of the prosecution? Yes, sir. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen, for your time, for your attention, for your dedication, which I know you will show during their deliberations. You just heard the defense spend about 15 minutes giving their closing arguments. They called Carl Watts, the cooperating witness, every name in the book. They constantly asked, is this possible, is that possible? Ladies and gentlemen, anything is possible. They gave you theories of what could, what, what, what would, and what has been. I'm not going to stand here and waste your time with theories and stories. I'm going to give you the evidence and the cold, hard facts. And I know, I'm convinced, that common sense will lead you to the truth. The truth is that the defendant, Alice Powers, is guilty. Ladies and gentlemen, who's on trial today? Not the gambler, not the cooperating witness, not the man you probably don't like very much. Carl Watts is not on trial today, folks. No one denies that Carl Watts is no model citizen. No one denies that Carl Watts attempted to kill John Powers. But that's not what's happening in this courtroom today. Carl Watts is not on trial. The defendant, Alice Powers, is on trial. Alice Powers is on trial because she conspired with Carl Watts to murder her husband. Alice Powers is on trial because she paid Carl Watts to kill her husband, to save herself from another beating, to save herself from more abuse and neglect. She was afraid and she had enough. Alice Powers took the law into her own hands, and that is not the decision for the defendant to make. Being afraid cannot justify an attempt at murder, not in our justice system. Ladies and gentlemen, you've heard testimony and evidence showing that the defendant, Alice Powers, was abused and beaten by her husband. In fact, at one point she was beaten so badly that her best friend, Gladys Fenton, had to take her to the hospital to be examined. Yet Alice Powers didn't call the police to report the beating. She didn't contact a domestic abuse agency. She didn't call for help at all. Help, ladies and gentlemen. Help, which would have put her husband behind bars. Here's what Alice Powers did do. Alice Powers contacted Carl Watts. She knew that Carl Watts used to work with her husband. She knew that Carl Watts had just got out of prison. She knew that Carl Watts badly needed the money. She knew that Carl Watts would, have, would agree <coughs> to help with her plan, her plan to kill her husband. And she knew that Carl Watts may know people who could help carry out such a plan. The defense claims that Alice Paris hired Carl Watts, but not to murder her husband. Of course not. They claim she hired Carl Watts as her private investigator, and that's it. Ladies and gentlemen, remember earlier when I spoke about common sense? Let's use our common sense here. Why didn't the defendant, Alice Powers, seek a trained and experienced private investigator? I'll tell you why. Because she never needed a private investigator, that's why. She needed a man who she could pay to murder her husband. A man who she knew had bad blood with her husband. A man who she knew who badly needed the money. And on May 27, 2008, was Alice Powers at home waiting for a phone call that her husband was caught cheating on her or wasn't caught, caught cheating on her? No. She was at the Paramount Hotel under an alias name with $5,000 cash. $5,000 cash, that's a lot of money for a private investigator. Think about that for a second. And you may ask, why was she at the Paramount Hotel under an alias name with $5,000 cash. I'll tell you. 
because she had already planned that night with Carl Watts. She planned with Carl Watts for the murder of her husband to happen that night. And both of her testimony and evidence of the defendant's phone conversation with Carl Watts. This was a phone call placed by Carl Watts after his arrest. This was a phone call placed from the 10th Precinct under the supervision of Detective Williams. This was a phone call placed by Carl Watts to the defendant, Alice Powers, at the Paramount Hotel. And when that phone call was made, and during that phone conversation, Alice Powers didn't know that the murder of her husband was unsuccessful. Alice Powers didn't know that Carl Watts had been arrested. She had no idea. As far as she was concerned, Carl Watts was calling to confirm that the murder was done. And in that phone conversation, the defendant, Alice Powers, asked Carl Watts, they didn't miss, it's done, it's really done. Are we to believe, common sense, ladies and gentlemen, are we to believe that these were questions by a woman to a private investigator who was supposedly investigating whether her husband was having an affair? Of course not. These were questions by one conspirator to another confirming that the job was done, as was stated in the, in the phone conversation by the defendant, that they didn't miss, that John Powers was murdered as planned. And in that same phone conversation, Alice Powers stated to Carl Watts, they'll get paid. I have the money right here. I have to get home. I can't find anybody, you know, to not find me here. Again, ladies and gentlemen, evidence showing that the defendant, Alice Powers, agreed to pay Carl Watts for the murder of her husband. The same evidence showing that the defendant, Alice Powers, needed to get home immediately to avoid any suspicion. Home, ladies and gentlemen, not the Paramount Hotel. Home, where Alice Powers would and should have been if she actually hired a private investigator. And when the detectives, after that phone call was made, Detective Williams, two uniformed officers, and Carl Watts went directly to the Paramount Hotel. When they got to the hotel, Carl Watts pointed to a woman rushing out of the hotel. Carl Watts didn't point to a random woman. Carl Watts pointed to the defendant, Alice Powers. She was wearing sunglasses and a scarf wrapped around her head. Let's stop for a second and ask this question. Why would a woman wear sunglasses when it was midnight and dark outside? For disguise, ladies and gentlemen. For disguise. She wanted to avoid being spotted at the hotel with $5,000 cash. Also, her testimony that when Detective Williams approached the defendant, not running at the defendant with guns drawn, approached the defendant, she initially denied her identity. When first asked whether her name was Alice Powers, the defendant said no. Again, why would a woman who had, no, who had done nothing wrong deny her identity to the police? She wouldn't. And immediately after that, the defendant, Alice Powers, pointed at Carl Watts and yelled, he's lying. I had nothing to do with it. Common sense, ladies and gentlemen. He's lying about what? He's lying about working as a private investigator? Come on. She had nothing to do with what? She had nothing to do with hiring Carl Watts as her private investigator? That doesn't make any sense. The defendant made that statement. He's lying. I have nothing to do with it. At that point, at that moment, because she, by seeing Carl Watts point her out to the police, she realized she was caught. At that moment, she knew that the police were there to arrest her for the murder of her husband. And if by some leap of logic, the defense's theory were true, which it's not, but let's play along. If the defense's theory is true, that, all, that the defendant, Alice Powers, did nothing wrong, she had nothing to do with any murder plot. That all Alice Powers did was hire Carl Watts as her private investigator. If that were true, Alice Powers would have told the truth to the police that night. Just like Carl Watts did after his arrest. 
Alice Powers would have told the police right then and there, not two and a half weeks later, but right then and there, that she had absolutely nothing to do with any murder plot. But did she say anything, ladies and gentlemen? No, and you've heard testimony. She didn't say anything. She didn't say anything because she never hired a private investigator. She didn't say anything because she didn't come, couldn't come up with anything to say. Here you have a woman for the, charged for the first time with a serious charge, attempt, arrested and charged for attempted murder, something she knew nothing about. She must have been shot, yet she made no statements and didn't deny anything. It took her two and a half weeks to come up with this elaborate story of a private investigator, two and a half weeks after her arrest. That's what makes sense, because that's the truth. And with the truth, based upon common sense and cold, hard facts, the evidence has shown beyond a reasonable doubt that the defendant, Alice Powers, took the law into her own hands when she knowingly and willfully paid Carl Watts to murder her husband. Alice Powers took on the role of judge, jury, and contracted for an executioner. Her actions diminished the dignity of our justice system. And although we may feel sorry for Alice Powers and how she was treated by her husband, it's terrible how she was treated. But we cannot allow anyone to take the law into their own hands. No matter how we may feel about Alice Powers' husband and his actions, no matter how we may feel about Carl Watts and his actions, we cannot allow anyone to take the law into their own hands. We cannot allow justice to be lost in the fog of empathy. Ladies and gentlemen, I thank you again for your time and your attention. And in your deliberations, please be fair and consider all the evidence presented. In all the evidence, the facts, common sense, the truth, will lead you to only one conclusion, that the defendant, Alice Powers, is guilty. Thank you very much. All right.